Hello all you freedom-loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. The UAW finally reached a satisfactory agreement with the big three. Striking workers have also begun to return to work. The conflict between Israel and Hamas has the potential to expand further. Israel's intensified military offensive has not neglected its media campaign. They have published evidence that Hamas is deceiving the world. On this issue, even Biden is very angry at the mainstream media's bias in favor of Hamas. House Republicans have introduced a pro-Israel bill. What's special about this bill is that this support for Israel comes from IRS funding. But can such a bill pass in the Democratic-controlled Senate? Miracles may happen again. The National Archives faced a FOIA lawsuit and they had to turn over the content of thousands of Biden's emails so will Biden have to pull a Hillary? Okay, let's get into it. General Motors has reached a tentative agreement with the UAW. It was the last of Detroit's big three automakers to reach an agreement with the union. This means that the UAW's six-week strike is coming to an end. Several people with knowledge of the negotiations revealed that talks between GM and the UAW continued on Sunday night into the early hours of Monday morning, culminating in a tentative agreement. The terms of the tentative agreement are not yet known, but they're expected to be in line with those already announced by Ford Motor and Stellantis Automotive Group. They include an immediate 11% increase in the maximum hourly wage and an additional 14% increase over the four and a half year life of the contract. Ford was the first to reach a tentative agreement with the union on Wednesday, followed by an agreement with Chrysler's parent company Stellantis on Saturday. The key financial elements of the deals, such as the 25% wage increase for most workers, were modeled after Ford's initial agreement. While these four and a half year tentative agreements still need to be ratified by the members of each automaker, the UAW may end the strike that it has been on since September 15th against the three major automakers after reaching an agreement with GM. More than 18,000 GM UAW workers were still on strike as of the time of Monday's agreement, but they could return to work within a few days. About 17,000 strikers at Ford have already returned to work, and more than 14,000 Stellantis strikers are in the process of returning to work. Yesterday, we shared that Dr. Ben Carson has given his full endorsement to President Trump. He called President Trump my friend, your friend, and a friend of America. When he announced his endorsement of President Trump, the crowd cheered so loudly that he couldn't even finish what he was about to say. And as I stand here today, I want to offer my most confident and full endorsement of Donald J. Trump. Because Dr. Ben Carson's endorsement of President Trump received many positive responses from our audience. Many have commented that they like and respect Dr. Carson and that he could be President Trump's VP. Couple in Love wrote that Ben Carson is a gentleman and an awesome human being. I've always liked him. He would have been a much better vice president than Mike Pence. Ben Vineyard commented that Ben Carson for vice president, please, and thank you. Ombre Diacero wrote that Dr. Ben Carson is not only a great doctor, but a great man, and I'd love to see him as President Trump's running mate. Melanie Hickey praised Ben and wrote, way to go, Ben Carson. In fact, there are many more such comments for Ben Carson. Yesterday, we also mentioned that Larry Elder dropped his White House bid, but he also endorsed President Trump. And Larry Elder and Ben Carson are both founders of the Old Glory Bank. So Old Glory Bank may just be the bank that you're looking for. Why would you give your money to people who hate you? That's the question Larry Elder asked when he was looking for a bank. He saw that too many banks are canceling hard-working, law-abiding Americans simply because they don't like what they do or what they stand for. So Larry got together with John Rich, Dr. Ben Carson, and some really smart bankers and technology experts, and they created their own bank, the old Glory Bank. 
It's built on one simple, strong, irrefutable principle, the United States Constitution, that brilliant document that forged this great nation out of freedom and liberty. Those same values created Old Glory Bank, a bank that values freedom, faith, and family, privacy, security, and liberty. It's a bank named after the flag that represents the fabric of this country. It's a bank that will never cancel you for believing in the greatness of America. Old Glory Bank has one physical location in the heart of Oklahoma, but because they created a seamless, mobile, and online banking experience, they have customers in all 50 states. Old Glory Bank stands with you, so open an account today at oldglorybank.com. It should only take eight minutes. The war between Israel and Hamas has been growing with Yemen's Houthi armed forces carrying out drone airstrikes against Israel on Tuesday, and also on Tuesday, the 25th attack on U.S. forces in Iraq was also carried out. Peter Lerner, a spokesman for the Israeli Defense Forces, said on the BBC's morning edition on October 31st that there had been a lot of firefighting last night between the Israeli forces and Hamas. Major General Daniel Hagari, the spokesman for the Israeli Defense Forces, said that Hamas had excavated a network of underground tunnels and bases underneath the Al-Shifa Hospital, which is the largest medical facility in Gaza. They also have tunnels underneath other Gaza hospitals. They used these tunnels to carry out the attack. He emphasized that Israel has concrete evidence that hundreds of Hamas terrorists flocked to these hospitals to hide after the October 7th terrorist attack. In fact, Hamas has set up a military command center directly inside Al-Shifa Hospital. They stockpiled weapons on the premises and they were able to fire rockets into Israel directly from the hospital. Israeli intelligence indicates that there are several tunnels outside the hospitals that lead to the underground bases. This way Hamas officials can reach the base without having to enter the hospital. Even the wards inside the hospital have entrances that lead to the underground base. Hamas also uses the hospital's energy facilities to power the base, and the base's conference room is even equipped with computers, carpeting, and leather chairs. Hagari also emphasized that the Al-Shifa hospital was not the only hospital to tunnel underground. It was only one of many. Hagari also mentioned that Hamas was very systematic in its use of hospitals. The IDF also released video footage of their interrogation of two members of Hamas. They mentioned that Hamas used the hospital's underground bases in order to hide and that these bases were connected to tunnels. The bases and tunnels were indeed excavated under the hospitals because Israel would not attack these infrastructures. In addition, these underground tunnels are not only under hospitals, but they are also in mosques, schools, and the workplace of the United Nations Relief and Work Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East. Hagari warned that when medical facilities are used for the purpose of terrorist attacks, they are likely to be excluded from international law, they will lose their protection from attack, and they will become legitimate military targets. President Biden probably never imagined that he would be the victim of fake news. During a private White House meeting last week, Biden expressed outrage about the New York Times news report on the October 17th bombing of Gaza Hospital. The headline in the New York Times on October 17th favored the Hamas claim that Israel was behind the Gaza Hospital airstrike that reportedly killed 500 civilians. The Hamas authorities, however, did not provide any evidence for their claim. Biden met with several top Wall Street figures in the Roosevelt Room of the White House earlier last week. Biden said that the headline in the New York Times was irresponsible and it could even lead to an escalation of fighting in the Middle East. What infuriated Biden the most was that the headline appeared in an American newspaper and Biden blames the fake news headlines for his canceled meetings in the Middle East. Biden's trip to Jordan was aborted when the news broke. Biden was on his way to the Middle East 
where he was scheduled to consult with Middle Eastern leaders on the Israeli-Hamas conflicts. However, Palestinian President Abbas canceled his meeting with Biden after news of the attack on Gaza Hospital broke. Jordan's King Abdullah II also called off a summit that would have brought Biden together with Egyptian and Palestinian leaders. According to separate investigations by United States intelligence and independent agencies, the bombing of the Gaza hospital was caused by the failure of a bomb that was launched by a group under the command of Hamas that is known as the Palestinian Islamic Jihad Group. The New York Times ran a rare editor's note on October 23rd, a week after the misreporting, offering an explanation about the October 17th headline. They acknowledged that the paper had relied too heavily on Hamas's claims, but they did not explicitly point out to readers that the claims could not be immediately verified. Vanity Fair says it obtained a string of slack messages from inside the New York Times. It showed that a group of New York Times editors had doubts and they debated the headline of the story about the attack on the Gaza hospital. But in the end, they tended to believe Hamas's account, which had to do with the hatred of Israel, in typical leftist thought. Israel is a free democracy. So why does the left hate Israel? Someone gave a very clear explanation. It has to do with the standard by which the left judge what is right and what is wrong. They have three criteria, the criteria of power, the criteria of race, and the criteria of class. Why does the left hate Israel? On the surface, it doesn't make sense. Israel is a liberal democracy. It extends full rights to women, to gays, and to its many Arab citizens. Like all countries which are made up of flawed human beings, Israel is flawed. But compared to most countries, not to mention its neighbors, it is a civil rights paradise. So why does the left hate Israel? The reason is that the left, and as I always emphasize, I am talking about the left, not about liberals, is not guided by a moral compass. It is guided by three other compasses, a power compass, a race compass, and a class compass. Specifically, the leftists believe that the strong must be evil and that the weak must be good. Let's begin with the power compass. Instead of evaluating people and nations on the basis of right and wrong or good and evil, the left evaluates them on the basis of weak and strong. If you're weak, you're good. If you're strong, you're bad. Israel is strong, therefore it is bad. America is strong, therefore it is bad. The Palestinians are regarded as weak, therefore, they're good. When you're guided by a moral compass, you don't ask who's strong and who's weak. You ask who's morally right and who's morally wrong. Fifty years ago, Israel was not a big issue for the left. Why? Because it was perceived as weak. But after the 1967 Six-Day War, in which Israel achieved a stunning military victory, it all changed. Israel became strong, so Israel became bad, and the Palestinians were weak. Similarly, the left divides the human race into good and evil. They believe that white people are evil and non-white people are good. The second of the left's compasses, the race compass, is another reason the left hates Israel. Just as it substitutes weak and strong for good and evil, the left substitutes non-white and white for good and evil. The left doesn't judge people by their actions, but by their race. That's why, for example, the left asserts that a black person cannot be a racist. Only a white person can be a racist. And that provides the second reason Israel is labeled evil. Israelis are considered white and Palestinians are not white. Never mind that more than half of Israel's population is not white. The result? The left essentially ignores Palestinian terror and loudly condemns Israel's responses to terror. Furthermore, the left believes that the rich are evil and the poor are good. Now to the left's third compass, 
the class compass. This is the third way in which the left replaces traditional Western and Judeo-Christian categories of good and evil. Instead of judging people's actions by the same moral yardstick, that of good and evil, the left judges people's actions based on their economic class. Rich people and rich nations are bad. Poor people and poor nations are good. This began with Karl Marx, who divided the world by economic class, not moral behavior. To Marx and to Marxism, good and evil is entirely class-based. Good is defined as workers, evil as owners. And that is the third reason for the left's hatred of Israel and of America. They are both wealthy. Spoken in such a straightforward manner, most people may find these three criteria very ridiculous and absurd. However, if we carefully observe the comments in the media and we examine the themes conveyed in movies and television productions, we will find that these three standards have penetrated into all corners of society. If we don't get rid of this kind of thinking, it may eventually make human beings lose their goodness. As fewer and fewer people perceive the world in terms of good and evil, substituting a power, race, or class compass for a moral compass, you will inevitably get more evil and more hatred of the good, beginning with Israel and America and ending with Western civilization. On Monday, House Republicans, led by new Speaker Mike Johnson, announced a $14.3 billion aid package for Israel. The proposed legislation will pay for the $14.3 billion Israel War Fund, with the $14.3 billion coming from IRS funding in the Inflation Reduction Act. The proposed offsetting cuts break with precedent since Congress does not normally cut other items in order to pay for emergency spending. The plan is one of the new speaker's first major legislative efforts. Many are concerned that such a bill is unlikely to pass in the Senate, but according to Speaker Mike Johnson, it will likely receive widespread bipartisan support. We get the impression that members of the Democratic Party are very united. They almost always vote in unison on all bills, but when it comes to Israel, their differences are out in the open. First, there were protesters at the Capitol against Israel responding militarily to the attacks by Hamas. The protesters were led by members of Congress, such as Representative Rashida Tlaib, who is a Muslim and a Palestinian American. Then, Democratic Representative Josh Gottheimer of New York, in a post on X, slammed 15 of his Democratic colleagues as despicable for voting against or present on a House resolution that was expressing support for Israel. On Friday, the Democrats in fighting over Israel threatened to turn physical after Representative Andre Carson repeatedly called Gottheimer a coward in an interview and he said, we can either handle this as gentlemen or we can do something else. But Carson's threats drew more people into the controversy. Jonathan Greenblatt, a prominent Jewish progressive and CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, issued a stinging critique. Greenblatt wrote, It's inexcusable for any member of Congress to threaten a colleague, and it's especially egregious that Andre Carson is threatening a Jewish member for speaking out at a moment when we're seeing a massive spike in anti-Semitism. What's the point? Indeed, Gottheimer wasn't the only one who had badmouthed Democrats who voted against the bill. Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz of California told CNN that she vehemently disagreed with Tlaib and Andre Carson's behavior throughout the process, and she called anyone who voted against the bill soulless. And this growing divide between Democrats doesn't appear to be ending anytime soon. It is therefore difficult to predict the fate of the new speaker's pro-Israel bill. The National Archives previously confirmed that through a FOIA response that they found 5,138 email messages and 25 electronic files about Joe Biden's email accounts. 
This was in response to a FOIA lawsuit that was filed by the Southern Legal Foundation. The Southern Legal Foundation, which is a conservative nonprofit law firm, filed the lawsuit a year ago after it was revealed that Joe Biden used three private email accounts when he was vice president. And now, after missing the deadline to turn over the requested documents, the National Archives has finally completed the search. As a result, NARA located 82,000 pages of emails from then Vice President Joe Biden. This is a substantial volume of potentially responsive records over eight years. These emails were sent or received on three separate private pseudonym accounts in order to conduct business deals with foreign officials. In fact, if you recall, there was a similar story about Hillary Clinton, wasn't there? Previously, it was Judicial Watch that revealed the story about Hillary Clinton's private server use. Back then, Judicial Watch sued for communications and records that were related to the Benghazi terrorist attack that left four Americans dead. Reportedly, Hillary Clinton shared classified information on her private server, including the name of a secret CIA agent. However, Hillary Clinton claimed that the emails were mainly about Chelsea Clinton's wedding and yoga. It was alleged that Paul Combetta, who was Hillary Clinton's IT specialist, used a Google account to transfer all of Hillary Clinton's emails from a laptop to the server. Reportedly, Combetta then used Bleachbit in order to erase tens of thousands of Hillary Clinton's emails. At the time, newly fired FBI Director James Comey and former special agent of the FBI, Peter Strzok, also discussed charging Hillary Clinton, but they only talked about it. In the end, they changed the wording from gross negligence, which is a chargeable crime, to extremely careless, which is not a crime. But in Biden's case, if NARA makes the files available, it might be too late to use bleach bit or take a hammer to the server. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you so much for your support of Front Page. Please remember that every like, comment, and share helps more people to see the truth. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you have already subscribed, we thank you, but please double check to make sure that you're still subscribed because some of our audience have reported that they're somehow unsubscribed without their knowledge. We've also heard that many of you don't get notifications of our videos anymore from YouTube. So when you do subscribe on YouTube, please make sure to tap the notification bell as well. Okay, this is our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth. Again, thank you for watching Front Page and we will see you next time.